Excellent. So today's question then is an abs. Oh, thank you very much. Today's question is, is the microphone switched on? That is science for you. Thank you. Uh, today's big question then for the lunch bar, can God and science coexist? And you know, I meet many people today who think that science has replaced uh, religion. You know, religion, they tell me, it's just based on wishful thinking, it's based on faith, whereas science is based on, on evidence and facts and data and so on. For example, Stephen Hawking, one of the most uh, influential physicists of, the, uh, of recent years, died a few years ago, um, very committed, very brilliant physicist, but also a committed atheist. And he believed that science has triumphed over everything, not just uh, religion, but theology and philosophy, anything that is not science. Let me give you a flavour of, uh, of how Stephen puts this. Uh, Stephen writes, philosophy is dead. And if you read the wider chapter in the book, uh, he doesn't just mean philosophy, he means theology and everything else. Philosophy is dead, he says. Philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly in physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. And we perhaps need to update that quotation. Scientists are the bearers of the iPhone LED lights of discovery uh, in our quest for knowledge. But you get the idea of Stephen's language there. We don't need anything other than science. And I can sort of understand why Stephen and others might think that, why science has been exalted to near quasi-religious status in our society. After all, isn't science, it's pretty cool, right? Science has graphs and gadgets and statistics and technology. And our political leaders in particular, I think, are in awe of science. We saw this during the response to, to COVID with the endless talk of following the science. And of course, here in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, our first minister, came out with this lovely little soundbite when the Pfizer vaccine was first announced. She proclaimed, science has saved us, almost religious language there. And this elevation of science <clears throat> above everything else in our culture, I think has elevated this belief that you sometimes hear that we don't need God anymore, that science has done away with God. Now, how might I respond to that? Well, as I uh, said in that uh, interview earlier, that brief interview, I love science. My academic background lies in science. My PhD was partly in computer science, uh, developing computational linguistic models and tools for studying ancient texts. That is quite a mouthful. Um, science, I think, is one of the best things that human beings have ever uh, ever invented. It's up there with a bacon sandwich. It's the bacon sandwich and it's science, I think, of the two. You are a tough audience. Never do that joke ever again. Um, now, for all of its power and effectiveness, though, for all of its brilliance and uh, even its beauty, actually, I think there's beauty in science, it is also very important that we remember there are some things that science can't do. Science has limits. And in fact, in some really important areas, science can do nothing worthwhile at all. Let me show you a little experiment, a little thought experiment to show you the limits of science. Consider this very famous painting on the PowerPoint slide. For those who can't see that in the corner, that is the Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo uh, da Vinci, one of the world's most famous paintings. And suppose we wanted to know why did Leonardo paint uh, Lisa del Giocondo with that enigmatic smile? I mean, that is a strange facial expression, right? Is she bored? Is she tired? Is she constipated? As something is not quite right. She's not particularly happy. What is going on? But suppose we say to ourselves, well, I've been reading Stephen Hawking. Science can answer every question. So the first thing we do is we scan her into a computer. In fact, job done. She's on my PowerPoint slide. And I write you a quick bit of computer code that will tell you what percentage of the dots, the pixels that make that up are red, green, or blue. Very exciting. Probably ain't going to answer the question. So what next might we try? Well, maybe we go to France, to the Louvre, to the, ga to the, uh, the gallery where she is uh, located, and we sneak in at night. Uh, we cut through the bulletproof glass that surrounds uh, the, pa the painting. We scrape off some of the paint from the Mona Lisa, and we do a quick spectrographic analysis on it to analyze the paint that Leonardo used. Um, highly illegal isn't going to answer the question, but actually since we've committed one crime, we might as well commit two. We also take a bit of the wood frame that she's painted on, the panels that she's painted on, and using a science called dendrochronology, we can figure out when the tree was cut down from which the wood panels were formed, from which Leonardo made that picture. None of those studies, none of that science, brilliant as it is, uh, none would tell us why he painted her that way. For that, we need art history. 
We need another discipline entirely. In fact, as the Nobel Prize winning chemist, Peter Medawar uh, put it, he wrote, he was a committed atheist, committed uh, brilliant scientist, but he recognized science had limits. In fact, he wrote a famous book called The Limits of Science, in which he says that there is indeed a limit to science is made very likely by the existence of questions that science cannot answer. And indeed, that no conceivable answer of science would empower it to answer. I have in mind questions like how did everything begin, what are we all here for, and what is the point of living? Now if we had time to dig into this we might add other things to Peter's list there actually. Questions like why is the universe rational in the first place? That question kept Albert Einstein awake at night. We might ask the question why do mathematics and science fit so well together? It's amazing the way that science, actually, num mathematics and the sciences fit hand in glove. Why is that? You see, if there is no God, numbers are simply something that Mesopotamian goat herders invented sometime around about the second millennium BC to keep track of uh, their herds. How is it then? that numbers and mathematics fit so well together, that we can use numbers to model the curvature of space-time, the growth patterns of flowers, or the orbital patterns of, pa of, of, pa of planets or electrons. Those goat herders must have got pretty darn lucky, quite frankly. And then, of course, why is it the human mind is so able to unlock the mysteries of the universe? Our minds are very good at answering basic questions, survival and reproduction. But on evolution, that's the only questions that exist. How is it then that our minds can unlock the secrets of black holes and, uh, and quantum particles? And to those very sciencey questions, we might add some very human questions. What is the value of a human life? We're going to be thinking about that on Thursday lunchtime when we look at the question of human rights. You know, modern human rights theory is built on the assumption that human beings all have uh, value and dignity, but science cannot help you there. Science cannot tell you the value of a life. It cannot do that. It can tell you how to save a life. It can tell you how to prolong a life. It can tell you how to destroy a life. But science cannot tell you the value of a life. That is a very different question. And that simply, ladies and gentlemen, is because science is morally neutral. Science is morally neutral. And that fact is illustrated uh, by the story of one of the most famous chemists of the 20th century. His name was Louis Frederick Pfizer. Uh, very, very influential chemist. And one of the ma major discoveries that he made is he uh, was instrumental in discovering how to artificially synthesize vitamin K. And vitamin K is used in your body for blood coagulation. You want vitamin K to be working properly, so if you accidentally cut yourself, your blood clots properly. And his discovery has saved hundreds of thousands of lives. But Pfizer discovered something else as well. In 1942, the US Army approached him and asked him whether he and his team at Harvard University uh, might be able to help them uh, develop a weapon that could be used to burn tracts of jungle and eliminate troops. And so Pfizer and his team at Harvard University, they invented a thing called napalm. That is a gel that sticks to human bodies when it burns. On the 9th of March, 1945, uh, 1,700 tonnes of napalm were dropped upon the city of Tokyo, burning 100,000 civilians to death. And even more were killed in Vietnam a couple of decades later. Now, maybe, maybe if you work really hard, you could justify Pfizer's discovery in the wider context of the Second World War. He certainly tried to. He tried to brush away questions of morality. But when you, as I say, when you see how it was used in Vietnam, it gets way, way harder. Pfizer's story is a salutary reminder that science can harm as well as heal. It can hurt as well as cure. And it's also a salutary reminder that science doesn't shut down moral or religious questions. Rather, it creates them. The more powerful we become through tools like science and technology, the more danger we find ourselves in and the bigger the questions get. And they get bigger and it gets more dangerous because human beings are, if we are honest with ourselves, a bit of a moral mess, quite frankly. And science is often part of the problem as well as part 
of the solution. Just look at the environmental crisis that we currently have and what's happened when many of the advances that science has given us, uh, you know, the combustion engine and plastic and so on, suddenly it turns out those things have consequences. And all of that reminds me that uh, in most cases, well, the reason we have an issue is that science is really good at addressing symptoms, but science is usually totally useless when it comes to addressing the underlying deeper causes uh, of problems. And let me illustrate actually of how that is the case by returning to that issue I just mentioned, one of the greatest challenges of our time, uh, the environmental challenges, uh, the environmental crisis that our planet is currently facing. What is the solution to the environmental crisis? You know, it's very easy to assume the answer is simply to use oil less, to uh, ban plastic packaging, reduce carbon emissions, or uh, any of those kind of things. It's easy to sort of pick those simplistic answers. But what if something much, much more profound is needed? One of the most influential climate activists uh, of recent years is Gus Speth. He's on the screen there behind me. He's an environmental scientist, an environmental activist, and lawyer. Uh, for many years, he was a senior advisor to the US government. He was Barack Obama's chief advisor on climate issues. He now works at the United Nations, uh, trying to deal with and raise more awareness of the issues that we face. He is also somebody, as far as I know, of no religious faith. I think when I've seen him asked about religion and spirituality, he would say he's agnostic. He doesn't, he doesn't believe there isn't a God. He doesn't believe there is one. He's sort of in the middle. So that makes his diagnosis of what is actually going on right now quite fascinating. Gus, in a recent interview, said this. He said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a cultural and a spiritual transformation. Interestingly, that Christians who have been involved in the sciences since the very, very, very beginning have long realized that brilliant as science is, we need more than just science and technology. In fact, Jesus alluded to this, alludes this in the Gospels. In uh, Mark's Gospel, the, one of, the, uh, one of the, the shortest of the four historical biographies of Jesus found in the Bible. And in fact, there is a copy of Mark's Gospel on the table for you. Uncover Mark if you've never read it. That's the Christian Union's gift to you. Take it away and uh, have a look. We hear these words of Jesus recorded uh, here in Mark. Jesus said, what good is it for a person to gain the whole world, yet to forfeit their soul? What can a person give in exchange for their soul? Whenever I read those words, I find myself thinking, Jesus was onto something here, right? Because we can gain power over nature. We can manipulate atoms. We can rip whole mountains apart. We can destroy ecosystems. We can find ever faster ways to send digital information around the world. All of these technologies we have, but if in the process we lose our very self, what have we actually gained? You see, what if the solution to the greatest challenges facing us as humanity need something more than just science? Science can help, but we need more than just science. For the Bible tells us that the greatest challenge, the greatest problem is the problem of the human heart. That greed and selfishness and apathy that Gus Speth talked about. We have the ability to use science for great good. We have the ability to use science for great evil, as we saw in the story of Lewis Pfizer, and the history of science is littered with people whose lives look very similar like that. And I would say the Bible addresses some of this stuff because it says that God created us to be like him and to be, to some extent, to be in a relationship with him. But too often we simply want to be God and seize power for ourselves and manipulate things to our own ends. And the whole sordid story of human history is the damage we have done in the process to, to God's good world and to one another. But maybe that sordid story of history is not the whole story. Next year, it will be the 55th anniversary of one of the greatest scientific achievements I think ever undertaken. We'll be celebrating next year, 55 years since human beings first landed uh, on the moon. The results of years of science and technology and engineering and study. 
And when Neil Armstrong, the first human being to walk on the moon, when he first saw the Earth from space, before Apollo 11 went up, he went up on an earlier mission, so they rehearsed a few things. And when he first looked out of the window of his little Apollo capsule and he saw Earth in the distance, he was deeply humbled. Neil Armstrong said, it suddenly struck me. It suddenly struck me that that tiny pea there in the distance, pretty and blue, was the Earth. I put up my, my thumb and I shut one eye and my thumb blotted out planet Earth. But I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. See, if we live in a godless universe, we are very, very small. We are just a tiny speck of pollution on a tiny insignificant rock orbiting a distant insignificant sun at some far off corner of the solar system. Our lives have no cosmic significance. We are just a little accident. On the other hand, the Bible says that tiny blue pea, covered with even smaller people in cosmic, uh, by cosmic standards, people with the capacity to reach the stars, and people also capable of destroying each other, the Bible says we are very precious in God's sight. And the Bible says that the God who made that world and that universe and put the whole of science into effect, then stepped onto that tiny little blue pea in the person of Jesus, so that we might have the chance of not just knowing about the design, but knowing the designer and knowing what life is really for. Because we need answers, not just to the questions of how do we do stuff. Science does really well in that area. But we also need to know why we are here and what life is for. Questions that science was never designed to answer. But Christianity, the worldview, the belief system from which science first sprang, I think might have something quite important to say in those areas. In fact, Jesus in particular said, I have come that you might have life and might have it to the full. And that is the invitation that God makes to each one of us, the invitation that is unique to Christianity, the invitation that God makes in Jesus to actually get to know, not just that there is a designer, but to actually get to know that creator and designer for oneself. Thanks for listening, and uh, we're going to invite our uh, MC back up to tell us what's going to happen next. So thanks, everybody.